You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 105 of the Common Descent Podcast. Hey, that last digit is a five. I was about to say five. Five. Now, for a very long time, episodes that end in a five have been a tradition ever since we decided to retroactively call it a tradition after the third time. But as we move into the triple digits, we have changed the tradition from extinction episodes to plant episodes. Yeah, instead of it's doom and gloom, it's flower and bloom. Very nice. Very nice. That's why I keep you around. <laughs> Which means that this is officially the first episode in our new number five tradition of plant episodes with our friend Dr. Allie Baumgartner. Yeah, Allie's joining us every episode with ending in a five now. For the foreseeable future. So this episode, after the news break, we will be joined by Allie to talk to us about carnivorous plants. I'm legitimately really excited <laughs> <laughs> this is a great, this is, it's great. We're going to hear from Allie about what carnivorous plants are, how they do what they do, and what we know about their fossil and evolutionary history. Spoilers, not much. Mm -mm. On top of all the other reasons to talk about this particular topic, it was requested. Once or twice? A lot. <laughs> People got real excited about the idea of us doing a series, an official series on plants with Allie, and carnivorous plants is by far the most requested of the topics. Requesters of this topic include Jesse, Sherry, Kieran, Jaster, Jill, Zabby, Nemo, Felix, Rebecca, Jonathan, and Tim. Good request, everyone. Good job, <laughs> mountain of people. You, you legion of carnivorous <laughs> plants. <laughs> Before we get into the episode proper, a few quick announcements. Number one, we have a Patreon. We sure do. Starting off 2021 strong with a great amount of support from our patrons. That is always appreciated. And, of course, among the goodies that patrons get for supporting us officially on Patreon is that when you join at a certain level, we'll shout your name out in gratitude here on the podcast. This episode, we would like to welcome Gabby, Lauren, and Ben. Welcome! Thank you so much for your support! Thanks for joining us, everybody. As far as other announcements, I think the only big one that comes to mind is that this episode will be coming out on the 24th. Mm-hmm. And that Friday, the Friday of the week this episode comes out, the January 29th, is officially our four-year anniversary. Yeah, we will be four years old as a podcast. Yeah, episode one officially released, uh, even before we were on po uh, Podbean. Mm-hmm. On January 29th, 2017, four years down. Pretty crazy. How about that? Thanks to everybody for sticking with us. Um, I'm sure we'll celebrate with a, some sort of celebratory tweet <laughs> or something along those lines. And with that out of the way, what do you say we talk about the news? Okay. I think there's been some cool news. 2021, this is some good news. Every episode, we like to talk about some recent news from paleontology, evolution, biology, the stuff we like, the stuff you like. To keep everybody up to date, Will News. Crocs. Fine. <laughs> this is an article about looking at why are Crocs so conservative. Okay, evolutionarily conservative, uh, meaning that the Crocs we have today aren't dramatically different from older, more ancient Crocs. Yes. Basically, it's looking at that old trope of... A Crocs have looked the same for so long. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at, okay, how much of that is true and why are the parts that are true true? Yeah. This is research by Maximilian Stockdale and Michael Benton in Communications Biology. And the article is by Max Stockdale in The Conversation. So crocodiles have been, crocodilians, you know, alligators, crocodiles, caimans, the gharial today have been labeled very often as living fossils for the fact that they so strongly resemble fossil members of the crocodilian and crocodilomorph lineage. Right. Crocodilomorphs, the cousins and relatives and ancestors of our crocodilians today, showed up 200 million years ago and early on started having members that looked remarkably like 
the Crocs we have today. Yeah. Same basic body shape, similar skulls, the long like. face, short legs, flattened body, powerful tail, built for the water, ambush at the shore. Like that body plan has shown up multiple times and has been very similar throughout this group's history. And basically they were wanting to find out what is the actual trend? What patterns do we actually see? Is it as conservative as it's often made out to be? And like, not so much do they deserve the term living fossil, but is it really that blatantly consistent? Mm -hmm. Another aspect of this that they want to look into is the fact that on the note of them being conservative, there's only 25 species today. Right. So it's not like they're a diverse species wise group and they're not morphologically diverse. I mean, the species look different, but I've had too many people not notice that they look different Right. They look different to me. <laughs> and the first thing that the researchers point out is th the lack of diversity is deceptive. Yeah. That th it is not quite as conservative as it seems on the surface. The 25 we have today all look very similar and strongly resemble many fossil groups. But many times various forms have come up within the croc lineage. Terrestrial, marine, herbivorous bipedal mm -hmm. all of these have shown up multiple times in different croc crocodile morph and crocodile form groups right so if we had a bunch of herbivorous crocs today we could just as easily say oh wow these are really conservative mm -hmm. this, look at all these ancient examples that are very similar and so this is a classic case of what we have now is a diminished example of what there has been that isn't to say there isn't some truth to the trope right yeah crocs have shown the similar body plan more often than those other more exotic forms. Mm -hmm. That is kind of, it seems, the croc default. And they were looking into it. Exactly what is the pattern there? And they used advanced evolutionary modeling. They developed a model by analyzing body size data from crocodile fossils combined with the evolutionary re relationships of the extant species. And they calculated a model of body size through time and calibrated it, matched it up with the dates of the fossils. Okay. So they ended up with a evolutionary model tracking body size change through fossil history. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up with body size change per unit time, which allowed them basically to measure the evolutionary rate of crocs. Right. In general. Right. Yeah. How quickly are they accumulating change? Exactly. When is it happening quickly? When is it happening slowly? Is it a constant rate? Is it a different rate during different times? And it revealed that most of croc evolutionary history seems to be pretty slow evolutionarily. Okay. That they seem to be evolving pretty slow with moments of quick evolution. Gotcha. And this is what many people might be shouting at, at their, their headsets right now, is a phenomenon known as punctuated equilibrium. Right. Long periods with little change and then quick change in short periods of time. Exactly. And so it seems that typically crocs are pretty stable in their body form. And then every now and then we see these bumps where different body forms arise and are evolved and new adaptations come in. And then it goes back to being fairly stable in their overall body form, which suggests to the researchers that the crocs have found a stable body form to survive in, and that the change only happens when external factors force them to adapt. Right. So it's not the crocs having to change, it's the environment changing around them, them responding really quick, and then when that change is done, they go back to their stable body form. Okay. Okay. Which kind of makes sense, like we've discussed before. The croc body shape is something that has shown up in lots of places besides crocs. Yeah, other groups have formed this short-legged, low-to-the-ground, long-faced, yep. aquatic predator body form. Yeah, it seems to work. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, basically, the, their findings to them suggest that they've found an optimum state and only change when outside environmental factors require it. Interesting. Which could potentially suggest why we don't have or didn't see the other forms stick around, is that those only showed up in 
peculiar moments in their evolutionary history, in relatively stable situations, they typically default back to what we think of as a croc. Very interesting. So we're we might possibly be living at a at a relatively normal time. Yeah. For crocs. Now the next question is why did they evolve this way? And we don't see this same evolutionary pattern in other groups. Right. You know, what is it about crocs that makes them evolve this way? And there's a few factors that could make them evolve differently. The fact that they're not able to control their body temperature, you know, they're not endothermic like us mammals, could mean that they are more sensitive to environmental changes. So therefore they have to react, you know, more more uh, aggressively. They have to evolve more to overcome environmental changes sure they can't just be stable and keep their body temperature the same if the weather shifts and then on the other side kind of almost counter to that they are also very stable animals they can go long periods through harsh times so they may be able to maintain their body form during times that others wouldn't right and they, they're only changing when it gets particularly difficult yeah and so they're not quite sure exactly what the factors are there's these are just kind of thoughts they threw out this is definitely a a subject that will require more research and they're hoping to approach it from different angles uh syncing it up with other factors in the environment to see if they see the similar pattern in regards to like water level or rainfall you know dryness aridity or something like that they also hope to look at similar groups like turtles and see if they show a similar trend oh uh, yeah that would be interesting and so is this a a tough cold-blooded reptile thing or is this a croc thing for some reason yeah yeah because for now it seems like temperature was definitely important but they don't know about other environmental factors and they also want to look at it with other aspects of the body you know like skull shape or other features other than just size right so they plan to they hope to revisit this from different angles but there does seem to be some truth to the trope it's still not that the crocs we have now are the same that were with the dinosaurs. Right. It's different species, different group. But, yeah, that body shape is very stable in this group. And it seems that it is kind of the one they default back to when things are all right. Very cool. Well, I'll be interested to see what more comes out of this team's research. Mm-hmm. Well, if that's news about a expected result, <laughs> I've got some news about a very unexpected result. About dire wolves. All right. This, not so dire. They were really friendly. Not that. That's exactly. Yeah. No, they were actually quite uh, frolicking. <laughs> they lived in meadows uh, full of flowers. <laughs> this is research that has been the, the the news went nuts about this. I saw lots of paleontologists making excited comments. The, about, this one had a very good title to it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah, there's been a, a bunch of cool articles going around, including the one we'll link to by Riley Black. In Scientific American, the paper itself is by Angela Perry et al. in Nature, and it is a bit of research that uncovers the genetic heritage of direwolves and finds it to not be where we thought it would be. Huh. Direwolves are a species of wolves that lived in North America during the Pleistocene, so throughout the Ice Age, that have for a very long time been compared with gray wolves, the same species that we have around in North America today. Mm -hmm. Dire wolves were generally bigger and beefier, but their skeleton is super similar to gray wolves. And so for a very long time, people have generally said, all right, yeah, these are probably close cousins of gray wolves, sort of the bigger, beefier version of gray wolves. This research sought to say, all right, does the genetic evidence say the same thing? Uh, spoilers, no. <laughs> no, no, it does not. So they collected uh, a bunch of direwolf material from all over North America, and they ended up with five specimens from which they were able to get genome data, ancient DNA. This is the part uh, where why I already knew all about this study and uh, wrote about it for ETSU, because one of the 49 researchers... <laughs> on this massive international project is Dr. Blaine Schubert. Hey, I know him. From here at uh, the Gray Fossil site. And one of the big reasons why he got involved is because one of the dire wolf specimens, one of the five that ended up having usable DNA, is from a cave in Sullivan County, Tennessee. Ah. 
which I don't know the exact location of the cave, but if it's in Sullivan County, that means you and I could probably drive there from here in like, what, 30 minutes? Yeah. If, if that. So yeah, I wrote a press release about this for our ETSU, but we'll link to Riley's article because uh, she did a really good job. <laughs> With that DNA evidence, they were able to compare dire wolves to gray wolves and then to coyotes, which are closely related to gray wolves, and basically to just all other wolves canids similar to wolves doggos and what they found is that dire wolves are not closely related to gray wolves all right not even close here's a list of canids that are more closely related to gray wolves than dire wolves coyotes which is not not unexpected no that makes sense african wolf ethiopian wolf all right doles african wild dogs and jackals. Wow. Dire wolves, according to this analysis, are outside all of that. Wow. Which means they are very distant. Yeah, that's not, Com- like, we were getting into weird ones. <laughs> yeah. So, gray wolves, we knew gray wolves originated in Eurasia. Mm-hmm. Dire wolves for a long time have been suspected to have originated in North America. Yes. And this seems to suggest that that's probably the case. They didn't evolve alongside gray wolves over in the old world. This analysis instead suggests that the last common ancestor of dire wolves and gray wolves was five to seven million years ago. Huh. Which is roughly the same as the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees. Yeah, like that's that's significant. So do they even count as wolves so that's been what has been going around in two ways one is that yeah a bunch of the headlines have been going on about how dire wolves aren't actually wolves and in the paper they point out that if they're so far outside all the rest of these then they're also not canis yeah so dire wolves have for a long time been canis dirus right what gray wolves are canis lupus Mm -hmm. uh, coyotes are canis latrans but if they are outside of all of the Canis species, they should be a different genus. So this paper suggests resurrecting an old name for them, Anocyon. Ooh. So they would be Anocyon dirus. Different genus. Wow. And I love the fact that Riley's article also uh, addresses the wolf name. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, okay, should we even call them dire wolves? And concludes that, well, that's probably not going to change. No. And quotes first author Angela Perry in saying, uh, quote, They will just join the club of things like maned wolves yep. that are called wolves, but aren't really. Maned wolf was the first one I thought of. I was like, yeah, yeah. we already call a bunch of stuff wolves that aren't yeah. wolves. And, and I think uh, some of the African wolves might also not be Canis. But I don't, I, I don't have that in front of me, so I I'm not sure. I can't remember. I'm trying to think through yeah. the but, dog episode. But there are a bunch of things we call wolves that aren't wolves, so sure, why not? Though Dire Dogs does have a nice ring to it. Dire Dog. I kind of like Dire Dogs. Dire Jackal. Though Dire Dogs does sound like something you get at a food cart. That's true. It's a dog with everything on it. With like, all the spice. Yeah, uh, exactly. The really spicy stuff on dire it. Dire Dog. Another surprising finding that they uh, uh, found was that... Uh, they also looked into hybridization. Oh. So you can compare genetic signatures to see, okay, we're different, these different species hybridizing. Because, as we discussed in the dogs episode, episode 94, canids really like hybridizing. Yes. They're here, real good at it. <laughs> here in North America, wolves, coyotes, uh, 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 domestic dogs, there's all sorts of gene swapping going on all the time. But this analysis found no signature of hybridizing in the dire wolf, that they were their own isolated group. As I say, which does support a less close relation. Yep. If you're not, if, you, if you're a dog and you're not hybridizing, you must be real different. Yeah, real weird dog, which also supports the idea that they were alone in North America for a long time. Ooh, good they point. became a distinct species in North America before gray wolves and at all moved over from the old world. So by that time, they were already their own thing. Which makes the similarities between them and gray wolves all the more interesting. Yeah, now it's convergent evolution. Because like when you were saying their skeletons are very similar, I the first time I saw a dire wolf skull, I was supremely disappointed. 
Right? Because I had always heard of dire wolves, you know, but I hadn't gotten to examine one. I just seen drawings and that's, yeah, dire wolves, the, the, the dire wolves. And then I saw a skull and it's like, no, that's a wolf skull. Yeah, it's just a wolf skull. It's basically the same size too. It's just black because it came from La Brea. Exactly. Like it's not very different in size. It's not, it's barely notably bigger or anything. And it just looks like a wolf skull. And so that now is fascinating. Yeah. Cool. So it's a real neat study. Very, very... I, it's also fun... I, I appreciate studies like this because I feel like it's good every now and then when this happens and kind of upends something that we had taken as like, yeah, no, classic Ice Age animal, the dire wolf... We've got thousands of them. Literally. We, at that oh, one site. We've got so many of these things. Episode 67. We got our, our, our tar pits overfloweth yeah. <laughs> with dire wolves. And it's like, yeah, no, pfft, whatever. And then someone comes along and goes, actually. It turns out. And I, like, not that, you know, this is not a narrative. This is just what's happening. It's us just doing science. But I appreciate when that happens from time to time because I feel like it's a good reminder. It's like, yeah, don't get too comfortable on our laurels. Like, at the gray site, just because we have over 100 tapirs doesn't mean we couldn't suddenly go, oh, wait, they're actually related to this tapir. Mm -hmm. Huh. Like, yeah, just because it's something we've known for a long time doesn't mean we're super accurate. You know, we might be missing a chunk of data that... All it takes is 49 researchers to uncover. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it also really emphasizes how really useful it can be to get DNA. Yeah, that makes a big difference. That it, it can tell points. And not that we may, you know, we could potentially still have figured this out just with skeletal yes. information. But the DNA is a real nice kick in the pants to be like, hey, you got to now start looking all the way over here. So it's a it's a real fun unexpected result mm -hmm. about a very famous animal. Well, and the nice thing about DNA findings as well is it can give you maybe the impetus that, hey, maybe take a closer look at the skeleton. Exactly. That you might not have taken because we had so we were so comfortable with it. Now you have evidence that you go, oh, actually, you know what? Yeah, you are right. The teeth are slightly different enough. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, speaking of wolves, some more. Sure. This bit of research is about the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, the marsupial wolf. Pick what name you prefer. One of the one of the things on the list of uh, stuff we call wolves that aren't wolves. Yep. And a study looking at their development in comparison to wolves to find out where the convergence between this marsupial wolf and the placental wolf begins. Like, when do they start looking like each other? Now, when you say development... Do you mean evolutionarily or baby dur during their life? Yeah, on to genetic. From baby to adult. Cool. So yeah, basically at what point does a baby thylacine start looking like a wolf? Ooh. And the surprising result is early. Cool. This is research by Axel Newton et al. in Communications Biology. And the press release is by the University of Melbourne in Eureka Alert. So Tasmanian tiger, the thylacine, it's famous for being a now extinct marsupial predator that is really, really similar looking to the gray wolf. Shockingly wolf-like. It is very, especially in the skull. The body starts getting a little different, but mm -hmm. the face is very dog for a marsupial. This research micro CT scanned the skulls of the thylacine and wolves through different growth phases. So from pup or joey <laughs> to adult and made digital reconstructions so that they could compare and see where do they start syncing up? At what ages do we start seeing them look the same? Even going so far as reconstructing early pouch, in pouch development of the thylacine. Neat. So like very young thylacines. And what they found is they start resembling each other very early on. Cool. Very young. So far that newborns already look a lot alike. So they that convergence is deep in their genome. It's not something they develop into. They mm -hmm. are, it is part of their initial development, which is supported and supports previous findings 
that showed similarities in their genomes, that there are similarities in the thylacine and wolf genetics that have also evolved convergently. This goes to show that, yeah, no, they are expressing similar morphologies from their genetics basically day one. Wow. So they're not just shaped similarly, they're also developing similarly. Exactly. This is also exciting because there was often a thought that marsupials didn't really have the ability to evolve complex skull shapes because of the way they develop Mm -hmm. in the pouch, and that most marsupials are born with unusually well-developed jaws because they're going to have to start suckling early on. Right. So they're, it's the same idea that's, that has been had with their front limbs, that they need front arms to start crawling before they're even a fully formed baby. Right, because they have to shadow of the Colossus yep. up mom to, into the pouch. And therefore it's hard to form super weird arms like fins or wings or something. But as we discussed in the marsupial episode and as this shows, that doesn't seem to be true for all marsupials. Like that didn't stop them from forming a wolf face. And this is also exciting because one of the questions that hasn't been answered is exactly how they reached this convergent form evolutionarily. And so hopefully this kind of research might shed more light on how they arrived at a similar body form. Very cool. Yeah. Man. Also, uh, Convergent Evolution, episode 70. Check it out. Also, Marsupials, episode 96. Ontogeny, <laughs> episode 33. This is this gets going to get longer and longer as we go on. Ancient DNA, episode 34. Yeah, the, the more, by episode 300, half the running time of the episode will just be listing other episodes. It's going to be like when you read one of the crossover events in a Marvel comic. And just <laughs> Every page has a see X-Men 23, yep. see Spider-Man 74, <laughs> see Hulk 50 feet. Yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be like, and then, yeah, no, this, this old course harkens back to that time the thylacines got into a war with the elephants go back to episode 194 (laughs) well one more bit of news that also centers around mammals but has much broader implications okay and another bit of news that is relevant to right here at home this is research that uses small mammal teeth to infer climate of past environments Cool. Very cool. Now, I... The climates were very cool? Some of them. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Now, uh, the last one I mentioned that I I knew all about it because I wrote a press release for ETSU because Dr. Schubert was involved in it. Mm -hmm. Well, this one I know all about it because I wrote a press release for ETSU because the authors of this paper, which was published in the journal P3, which, as we've mentioned before, is the abbreviation we use to avoid saying paleobiology, paleoclimatology, and paleogeography. That actually might not even be correct. I don't think that that is. <laughs> but uh, so, P3, and the uh, the authors are Julia Schapp, who is a mm-hmm. recent graduate of the program here, and Dr. Josh Samuels and Dr. Andrew Joyner, cool. uh, who are two other professors uh, here at ETSU. This is a combined paleo and GIS, so geospatial data mm-hmm. study. And like I got to write about it, which also I've been I've been saying has made this episode the easiest episode I've ever had to do. Yeah, David it's, cheated it's a this guest, episode. <laughs> guest episode. Didn't have to work for it. Two bits of news that I've already written about. Oh, I've just been relaxing all week. <laughs> So I wrote about it, which means that I have to get excited about it because that's my job is yep. to, hey, here's how it's cool. But also this this paper is awesome. It's I love when this <laughs> happens because it's all cool research is awesome. Like, well done, all researchers. But I know these people. This is right? particularly they're uh, people I know are doing cool stuff. And they're all cool people. Yeah. This is a cool group of people. Anyway, let me tell you about this study. <gasps> what Julia et al. set out to do is to first determine, can you infer climate from the teeth of rodents. This is based on a concept called ecometrics, which is a method of studying, measuring the parts of an organism's body whose structure is influenced by the environment. Yeah, because at at face value, when you first say, can we tell climate by looking at their teeth? That sounds weird. Yeah. Like, do you mean like tossing bones? Like, (laughs) like, what do you (laughs) mean? Right, you shake them up. (laughs) <laughs> but teeth are largely influenced in herbivores by
by vegetation. Yeah. And vegetation is largely influenced by climate. Yeah, if I live in a desert, I need different tools than if I live in a rainforest. Yes. And so it actually makes a lot more sense than it sounds like at first. Specifically, they were looking at variation in tooth crown height. So a mammal tooth, and most really teeth in general, has two parts. The root, which sticks in the gum, and the crown, which sticks out into the mouth and is the business end of the the tooth. It's the part on top, the crown. More in episode 88 about teeth. Different species of mammals have different crown heights. Some, the crowns are very short. Some, they're very, very tall, like uh, particularly in rabbits. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that these researchers did is they randomly selected 100 points in modern day North America and collected data on local climate conditions and then what kind of teeth are found in all of the rodents and lagomorphs, so rabbits and pikas, that live in that place. Oh. Right, what percentage of them are high crown versus low crown, what's the average crown height, things like that, as well as mean annual temperature, maximum precipitation, annual precipitation, and so on plugged it into a statistical software and said, find the correlation. Is there a pattern? Is there a pattern here? And uh, what they found is, yes. In fact, a very strong pattern. So strong, in fact, that they were able to derive regression equations. Whoa. Which basically means, here's a math equation with a couple of variables, and the variables are tooth data Mm -hmm. percentage of high crowned among the species or average tooth uh, height crown height and the result of the equation is a bit of climate info mean annual temperature uh annual precipitation things like that so basically you now have these math equations that if you go measure a tooth and put the correct measurements into the equation you know the, the ones it asks for it will then tell you yeah. The climate info that that tells you. Yeah. 12 degrees. And that's awesome. Like Which that's, is super cool. That's a tool now that can be just openly easily used. Yeah. And that's so awesome. And then they went and used it. They picked 73 fossil sites across the United States. Wow. Uh, a United States and then a few in Canada and Mexico, mostly in the U.S. Uh, sites that had at least 10 known fossil species of rodents and lagomorphs, small mammals. Made note of, all right, what percentage of these species is high crown versus low crown? What's the average crown height? All that data. Mm -hmm. And then plugged those numbers into their various equations. And the equations were things, average temperature, maximum temperature in the warmest month, minimum temperature in the coldest, all sorts of different temperature and precipitation. And came up with temperature and precipitation data for 73 different fossil sites, which... Uh, ranging from 37 million years ago to less than a million years ago, matched up with trends we see from other methods. Cool. Using chemi- chemical analysis or leaf margin analysis, they found generally it has been getting w- cooler and drier with fluctuations at places where we knew there were fluctuations. Wow. So right off the bat, this method tracks, it, it matches what we've seen using other methods of estimating climate data that's that, that's that's so awesome both because wow yep. <laughs> like wow but also they came up with a new method to estimate and potentially derive climate information and then in, turned around and tested it yeah. fairly extensively so in this one research it we now have a new tool that seems to have a pretty good road test. Yeah. Now, they mention in the paper that this isn't the first time anyone's ever tried to do this, but typically this kind of study is done with larger mammals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they make the point that small mammals tend to not only be more restricted in their range, yeah. right? they don't migrate like a large mammals might, so you're getting a local climate signal. Yeah, exactly, like th- this rabbit was not coming from Nevada to Georgia, it, it's right. from Georgia. And also that rodents and uh, other small mammals evolve more quickly in Mm -hmm. response to environmental change. uh, As there was a line in the paper, I think, or it might have just been a line that Julia said to me in an email, sometimes millions of years sooner. Yeah. So this tracks changes, in theory, more 
reliably more yeah, precisely. precisely exactly you have higher resolution because instead of having to wait such a long time for a bigger species to respond these are happening more quickly and josh made the point in an email when i was talking to him that this is a method now that you could use where you don't have chemical information or you mm -hmm. don't have leaves to to look at the margins it's a whole new approach and the really the main reason why I was writing a press release about it for the museum is that one of the 73 fossil sites they used uh, to test was the gray fossil site, which makes this the first officially published estimate for temperature and precipitation for the gray fossil site. Do tell. Not the first ever, because our friend Allie, uh, I believe, uh, did that in her thesis, mm -hmm. but that's not officially peer-reviewed mm -hmm, uh, research mm -hmm. yet. So this is the first peer-reviewed estimates. And what they found was they estimated here in Gray, so East Tennessee, a mean annual temperature of 16.8 degrees Celsius, which they note is similar to modern-day Atlanta. Ooh. And annual precipitation of 1,343 millimeters, which is similar to modern-day Tampa. Oh. Ooh. So we had a temperature and seasonality uh, uh, similar to Atlanta, which is, you know, four hours south of here. Mm -hmm. But precipitation at this time was significantly higher than anywhere in the region. For, you know, Tampa's, I don't know how far away is Tampa. Ten from hours. Here. Ten hours from here, <laughs> says Will, who's lived in both those places. I was about to say, I, was, I would be perfectly comfortable in Gray. I lived yep. in both these places. <laughs> Very awesome. It's such a cool study. Well, I, as I've said before, I always like studies that introduce a new technique. You know, that's not just, hey, we found some cool information, which is awesome, not to diminish that. Mm -hmm. But when it's like, hey, we developed a new way to find awesome information. Right. We found some awesome info, and now so can you. Yes, because now any place on the planet that has rodents or logomorphs can potentially use this. Yeah. And rodents and logomorphs are everywhere. Yeah. So this could be vastly helpful, even if it's just corroborating, even if it's like, okay, well, you know, here in Germany, we've tested multiple ways to find what the climate was at this fossil site, but we haven't tested the teeth. And now we can add another bit of support that yes, indeed, it was this yeah. hot and wet. Well, and indeed, uh, the, these estimates for the gray fossil site match with earlier... Uh, unpublished peer in peer-reviewed stuff, but earlier estimates and all together matches with what we know of the fact that we have fossils of plants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and alligators, yep. which shouldn't have been able to survive in a place that was much colder. Yeah, which we don't have estimates. in this area now. Exactly. So it's it's been a corroborative tool. It's an additional method to study things. And it's a really cool, it's geospatial Im information plus climate data plus fossil data. It's a really cool study. Well, and it's, it's so important because it's that, it's that beautiful, you know, cross-disciplinary, but also adding confirmation. It's a great tool for both if you don't have stuff, but if you do as well, here's another extra way. Yeah. And... This will be great for existing fossil sites, but if a new one pops up, yeah, all right, well, this might be a quick, easy way to f immediately get that info. So well done, everybody. This is so exciting. Oh, good stuff. Hey, speaking of people from ETSU and also cool stuff and also environments and probably a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, lots of other things. Great fossil site, episode 14. <laughs> Let's wrap up the news and move on to our main event. After the break, we will be joined once again, as we are always delighted to be joined, by Dr. Ali Baumgartner to Allie. talk about carnivorous plants. I'm so excited. Hi, Ali. Hi, guys. Welcome back. I'm Welcome so back. I'm so excited. <laughs> this is the first episode, officially the first episode of our new tradition of doing a plant related episode. Every episode that ends in a number five. I'm so proud. This is like, this is an official alley episode. 
an offi- yeah, this yeah, one, like, this one they knew was coming. Yeah, like this is this is <laughs> was planned and and is part of a list and everything. It's awesome. That's true. This is the first time that it hasn't been a surprise that I'm yeah. here. Yes. No, this is like this is on the schedule <laughs> and it will be this is our new tradition. So for the the it, for the foreseeable future, we will have you back here every 10 episodes to talk about plants. Now, this episode, episode 105 is about b- by far the most requested plant topic mm-hmm. on our list, carnivorous plants, which I'm excited about because I don't know anything about carnivorous plants. Uh, they've always been my favorite plants as a kid, just because they were the ones most like animals. I knew that the, that the was... most crocodile-like plants. <laughs> yep, I knew yep. that was exactly what you, how you were going to finish that sentence. As soon as yep. it started, I knew where it was going. <laughs> so before we get into the discussion, just very quickly, uh, Ali, you've been on the podcast a few times. Last time we talked to you, I believe you had just recently started your new position over in Kansas. This time we're talking to you. We haven't seen you all year. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was definitely giggling at the haven't seen you all de- all year dad joke. Uh, just let that the- joke gets better every year. <laughs> every year. <laughs> let the record show I did actually appreciate that. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, so things are going well. I still like my job, which is good because I thought this was the job I always wanted to have. <laughs> so the, no. fact, the fact that I'm still enjoying it is very much a good sign. Yeah, so right now I'm in the middle of a big project reorganizing the collections but in a way that makes sense for the mammals, which is so much fun because I get to open every cabinet and see who's inside. And then the other exciting thing is that uh, the Sternberg Museum has recently started posting outreach videos on our YouTube channel. And my video was the first one to go up because I was told I had the highest energy. So that does not surprise me at were, all. Were you was that a surprise to learn that about yourself? Um, I mean, it shouldn't have been, but it was. But uh, it's funny watching. I watched the video just to like I don't know quality control. And the thing that podcast listeners don't get is the fact that if I am speaking, my hands are moving. Mm-hmm. And yep. if you watch my YouTube video, you get to appreciate that like wide screen. There's a lot of moving. So <laughs> if, if you want to actually see my face, that's an opportunity. Well, we'll put that link in the episode description so people can follow it. Yes, yes. Let's go ahead and get started with our topic. Allie, before we do anything else, what is a carnivorous plant? How, how does that work? How does, yes. That, Tell us about it. <laughs> how does one do? That is the best question, I think, for this topic. So the thing that I found most fascinating to preface is that Darwin actually wrote a book on carnivorous plants. Did you know that? I knew of that he, had, he did. Right? I knew that he had done research. <laughs> and when I went to Downhouse several years ago, uh, Darwin's house is now a museum. But out front, they had just a whole bunch of carnivorous plants for sale. Because he was real big into yeah. plants. They had a bunch of pitcher plants. Well, yeah, because they're awesome. But yeah, so he wrote a book on uh, insectivorous plants in 1875. Uh, and that showed up in every single paper that I found about carnivorous plants. <laughs> it started off citing that book. But yeah, so when you think of plants, you don't normally think of them being carnivores. Like the whole thing about plants is that they can make their own food. So... Refresher on photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, broadly speaking, takes light and water and makes energy. Well, carbon dioxide too. It makes energy. That's it. You have light, you have water, you have carbon dioxide. But in reality, being a plant requires more than that. They also need nutrients. And that's the limiting factor. So particularly nitrogen, because plants can't use atmospheric nitrogen, they have to use a different form of it. And there are two ways that you can deal with limiting nitrogen. You can do the boring traditional route and use uh, rhizobia. So you can have nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the roots. But that's boring. (laughs) (laughs) The other option is you could just eat animals and then you could take the nitrogen from them. So 
you tend to find carnivorous plants in environments that are only nutrient limited. So they have good light, they have good water, but they are limited in nutrients. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So because the nitrogen in particular is essential for plant growth, it is one of the backbones of chlorophyll. So without nitrogen, you can't even make the stuff to make energy. So those are the basics. I would like to... (laughs) I would like to shout out the International Carnivorous Plant Society for being possibly the sassiest professional society that I have ever come across. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Because, like, you know, professional societies are known for, like, using very professional language and measured, oh my goodness, very much not (laughs) the International uh, Carnivorous Plant Society. I would like to read to you why you don't call them insectivorous plants. We do not call these plants insectivorous plants because no self-respecting carnivore is going to check the ID of a potential prey to make sure it is an insect. Some carnivorous plants do specialize in capturing insects, but they will consume whatever they can. (laughs) (laughs) They also go on, this is my favorite, they also go on to uh, talk about the difference between a carnivorous plant and a murderous plant. Oh. Yes. So a carnivorous plant is, you know, killing it to eat it. And a murderous plant is just like getting rid of predators. <laughs> wow. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Like a toxic plant potentially could be considered a murderous plant. Yeah. So, for example, and I'll get into this more in a moment, but like sticky traps, having some sort of like sticky substance on the plant is actually really common even in non-carnivorous plants. And so you can have ways to deter predators, but the way, what are the, sorry, again, I want to read directly from this this society because they're sassy. If these plants kill non-plants in an obvious body present way, but do not derive significant nutrition from the victim, they are considered murderous plants. (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. If, if you don't eat your murder victims, then yeah. you're just yeah, you're just a killer. <laughs> They're killing for sport. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I I spent a lot of time on their website because <laughs> like oh, they had some hot takes and I was here for it. <laughs> so when we're talking about their food, you mentioned it's not just insects. And now presumably we mean that it also includes spiders or ticks or basically any little creepy crawlies that are about the right size yeah so by and large the vast majority of their uh prey which is it's so funny to think of plants having prey uh the vast majority of their prey are arthropods of some variety a lot of it is insects but it could be spiders and the like sometimes it's like there are crabs that will get stuck. It will, I'll, again, I'll talk about that more. Ooh. <laughs> but some of the larger pitcher plants can even trap small mammals. So it's whatever is small enough to fit inside. They they don't discriminate. They don't check the ID of their potential victim. <laughs> it's a, hey, if you die inside of me, that's on you. <laughs> I cannot be held responsible. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So are you ready to tell, tell us about some... Uh, examples. What is the modern diversity of carnivorous plants? Because there's not just one type. This isn't like uh, when we talk about like bats, where it's, yeah. that's one group. This is more like when we talked about trees. Yes. This is a thing that plants have done multiple times. Yes. And okay, this, I did not really know much about carnivorous plants before I started researching for this episode. Like I knew the basics I knew where to find them if I need... That sounds really menacing. I knew where to find them if I needed to. <laughs> I knew where they lived. I know a guy. <laughs> yes, exactly. You want, me, you want me to deal with that fly? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I didn't fully appreciate what I was dealing with. So we'll get into this. The fossil record is is interesting. But so a lot of this understanding is derived from DNA evidence, like a lot of molecular clock sort of stuff. But it would seem that carnivory evolved independently nine times in five different orders. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like nine times. That's the part that I'm super hung up on. Yeah. Like that's, that's a significant number of groups all, all wanting to kill. (laughs) 
Pl- All right. Plants are secretly murderous. They just don't always <laughs> get the chance. <laughs> yeah. So there are five orders within approximately 12 genera. So spread across the orders. And then there are almost 600 species. Wow. Whoa. Right? They're actually a whole lot more diverse than you think they are. Because, like, I, again, like, two weeks ago, I I could probably name, like, four or five species. And I didn't know that I was missing, <laughs> you know, 595. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This, this is one of those scenarios where I... I I, I always love these episodes, as we've said, because we just get to learn. But it also lets me feel like how most other people who aren't biologists feel. Like when I talk about animals and they're like, I didn't know there were that many kind of this animal. So I, I knew of the a couple of the types of carnivorous plant. <laughs> and then you were like species are like, oh, yeah, I guess there might be more than one species of each of those types, too. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said 600. <laughs> No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, they're in five different orders. And I'm going to go through this really quick because I know that most people aren't one familiar with or two probably interested in uh, the different plant orders. But there's only five. So I can go through them pretty quickly. So, the second most uh, species rich is the Caryophyllia. Karyophyllales. These are the kind of words that you don't actually say. You just write them in scientific papers. I practice Here, that. here. <laughs> <laughs> so the karyophyllales include uh, like cactus and carnations and things like that. You know, broad group. They have about 208 species, roughly. But they include two of the most diverse and most recognizable families. So the uh, Droseraceae, which is the family that includes both the Venus flytrap and the sundew. As, oh, okay. Yep, heard of those. As well as Nepenthiaceae, which is the family named for Nepenthes, which are the really big pitcher plants from like the Philippines and Malaysia. So those are all in the same order. And then Oxidaliales, which is like the wood sorrel, which is not a shamrock, but looks like one, has one species, Aracales, which includes like tea, ebony, kiwi, rhododendron. They have 34 species. That's not a whole lot. In fact, there are in Poales, which is the order that includes grasses, there are four species of carnivorous plants. They're all, I think they're all, but one are bromeliads. But the most diverse group of carnivorous plants are the Lamiales, which is the order that is named for mint. So mint and olives. Hmm. And so the most species rich family is Lentibuliariaceae. I am primarily going to be talking about um, the the order Caryophyllales um, because that's the most charismatic <laughs> species the ones that most people are familiar with the ones that most people care about are in, are in that group so i'm mostly going to be talking about that so there are carnivorous plants on every continent except for antarctica and a lot of islands they're actually very common on islands which is probably what's helping um, increase the number of species because you have these island endemic uh you know pitcher plants that, well not just pitcher plants but carnivorous plants because think about plants is if they get separated, all they could do is speciate because there's no way that they're going to be able to like travel and see their family again. Yeah, there's no family reunions for plants. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> so there are five main types of... All right, okay. There, here's a quiz, guys. There are five types of carnivorous plants. Can you name them? All right, let's see. Pitcher plants? <laughs> yes. Uh, fly traps. Yep. yep. Sundews. Yep. Okay. And then that's all the carnivorous plants. And then that's all the well. There's also the <laughs> sticky ones, which might be sundews. That's yeah. They're the same category. All right. And then, based on what Ali said earlier, big pitcher plants. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Number four. Um. And then uh, whatever Audrey two. Yes, was. Audrey two. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and piranha plants. Yeah, the big <laughs> yellow pod. And then the big, the big yellow ones. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, and honestly. 
like two weeks ago, those were the three types that I could name. So you, yeah. have, you have the pitcher plants or the pitfall plants. You have the fly paper or sticky traps. Um, you have the snap traps, which are like Venus fly trap and things like that. And then the two that you didn't name, the bladder traps. And so there's basically only one species that does this. So I forgive you. And then the lobster pot or eel traps. I'll get into this. What? Yeah, I want to hear about all of these. I know, <laughs> Tell right? me about all of these. Right? This is great. Okay. So I'm going to start with the ones you've heard of and move down to the ones you haven't. Okay. So pitfall pitfall traps, the pitcher plants, like this is something that you could probably easily envision. So the leaves are folded into these deep, slippery pools with uh, digestive enzymes. And that's important. They tend to, they have to be slippery. They tend, well, they tend to be slippery. They tend to be deep and they have these digestive enzymes. Um, So there are the two most famous genera of pitcher plants are the Saracenia, and that's what we have in the U.S. So if you go to like a cranberry bog up in Michigan, the pitcher plants there are Saracenia. Uh, and then there's Nepenthes. Nepenthes are like the holy grail of pitcher plants. You know, if you watch, you know, Planet Earth or anything like that, mm-hmm. and they show you a pitcher plant, it's Nepenthes. Like <laughs> It's always that. And so when you were going through the, just the, the orders and everything, pitcher plants have like separately evolved multiple times in different groups. Yeah. That's something I'm learning. I didn't know that different groups had all gone, hey, what if a pot with a stomach at the bottom? Yeah, what if we made a leaf stomach? Yeah. I also was going to ask that question because you said that group has the big pitcher plants and I went, wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> So there are multiple origins of pitcher. I mean, I, I guess maybe we'll get into this a little oh, yeah. bit later. Uh, short answer. Yes. Long answer to be continued. Right, I'm going <laughs> to talk about this more. Okay. Any other questions about pitcher plants before I move on? This is great. I am really enjoying. <laughs> this is fantastic. How little you guys know. No, this is we're, fascinating. We're 15 minutes into this. Mind's blown. <laughs> yep. So pitcher plants, the basic uh, uh, thing it hits the side, slips, falls into the bottom. Classic Dungeons and Dragons trap. Now you're in there being dissolved by acid. Yep. Yep. Done. There you go. S- straightforward. Okay. The second type, the flypaper trap. So these are the the types of sticky trap. So these are again modified leaves that are covered in these stalked glands, um, and they exude a. This is a great technical term, a sticky mucilage. So, yeah, yeah. mucilage <laughs> is, have you ever, if you've ever eaten or cooked with okra? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that sticky residue inside the okra is mucilage. So the stuff that is in okra is basically the same, broadly speaking, type of thing that you have on the stalks of sundews, only far worse. <laughs> So, uh, and the thing about it, though, is that, you might not know, there are actually two types of flypaper traps or of sticky traps. There are active traps and there are passive traps. So there are the ones that just the insect or whatever gets stuck on it and uh, eventually it will be, you know, that it will be digested, it will be dissolved. And then you have the ones like the sundew that kind of move to hold it in. So they, they yeah. once it sticks, then they grab it. It starts curling in on the insect. Exactly. And, and wrapping it up. Exactly. So some of them just sit there and, oh, you got stuck on me. Well, eventually I'm going to eat you. And then you have the other ones like, oh, you're stuck now. And give it a big old <laughs> dissolving hug. <laughs> so are they is is it the general trend with uh plants that they are releasing you said digestive enzymes mm-hmm. which i assume is basically the same idea as our enzymes they break down cells they break down tissue exactly and then they are, are capable of absorbing uh the nutrients Makes you into that fall out. nutritious goo exactly yes. and that uh the ability to uh absorb the nutrients from the organism that is being consumed is one of the things that differentiates a true carnivorous plant from what is called a proto carnivorous plant. So somebody, I say somebody, they're people, plants are people too. Uh, So somebody who doesn't necessarily have 
all of the things on the checklist. You know, they might be able to trap things, but they might not. They might need to phone a friend to digest them. And that's one of the things, like, what are we talking about? Oh. And I, like, I'm leaving breadcrumbs all, all <laughs> through. Like, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to this later. So the sundew that we have here in North America is in Drosera. So that's what the family is named for, Droseraceae. But my favorite carnivorous plant, which I'm sure you would probably would have asked me, but I don't want to wait until you ask me. Uh, <laughs> my favorite carnivorous plant is Trifiophyllum, and you've never heard of it. <laughs> so Trifiophyllum is a carnivorous plant from West Africa, and it is a passive sticky trap plant. And the name refers to the fact that it has three types of leaves. So it is a liana. And so there are three types of leaves on this plant. You have the uh, modified leaves that are the stalks that are the, the sticky trap. Uh, and then you have normal, like, photosynthetic leaves. And then the best part, <laughs> in my opinion, is the third type of leaf, which is modified for climbing. Sorry, this is a bit of a tangent, but this is the best plant. The leaf is modified for climbing. The tip of the leaf is split into two hooks that it can use to grab onto like the bark of trees so that it can continue to grow up and be a vine. It is amazing. It's wow. a grappling hook plant? <laughs> it's a grappling hook plant! So it's if it's a vine, does that mean that it is carnivorous and parasitic? It's not deriving any sort of, it's not deriving any sort of nutrients from whoever it's climbing on. And it's not like a strangler fig that is going to choke, like surround and choke the life out of it. It is rooted in the ground and it is just using another plant for scaffolding and it is getting its nutrients from these sticky traps that are trapping insects. Wow. I know it's not doing this. But my brain, no matter how hard I try, cannot cannot stop picturing it scuttling up yep. the sides of trees. Just, just leaving <laughs> little traps behind. Yeah, it's just sticking to insects as it goes. I that's love it. fantastic. Very it's my cool. Favorite. So yeah, so that's and that's why it's my favorite. Okay, so and then the last one that you guys have already heard of are the snap traps. So again, super straightforward. They have hinged leaves that snap shut uh, when the trigger hairs are touched. And I think this is m- uh, much more common knowledge. I feel like this comes up in a whole lot of like Planet Earth style videos. But the hairs are super sensitive, but they are also arranged so that they won't be triggered by you know, rain or something like that. So you have Mm -hmm. to have two touches of the hairs a certain amount of time apart for it to snap shut. But the cool thing about it is this snap trap carnivorous plants are some of the very few instances of rapid movement in plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, like, you can see it move. I mean, it's slower than you think it is, but it's pretty fast for a plant. I mean, it's fast enough to catch stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's it's faster than some organisms <laughs> in key moments. In <laughs> key mo- yes, exactly. It's it's faster. It's it's uh, when you're run- running away from the bear, you only have to be faster than the slowest person. <laughs> like same sort of thing. <laughs> so, so you've probably you know you're probably very familiar with uh, at least one type of snap trap, the Venus flytrap. I had some. So it's in the genus Dionea. Fun fact about Venus flytrap. Uh, my grandma had one when I was growing up. She kept killing them. And it turned out it's because she kept trying to feed them ground beef. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that didn't, it didn't like that. Yeah, no. They, mine didn't survive either. They, they, What large ungulate did you try to feed yours? I did feed it a spider. Uh, that should have worked. <laughs> I fed it a spider, but it was a big spider, so I don't know. Like, for the size of the trap. <laughs> So, yeah, most people are familiar with Venus flytrap, but there's also, if you like Venus flytrap, but wish it were a little bit more aquatic, there is Aldrovanda. So Aldrovanda is basically, it's called the water wheel plant, and it's basically the same sort of thing, um, except for it's aquatic. So it's really cool. It looks like a water wheel. So it's got all these, it's uh, because the 
The leaves are arranged in whorls, so it's arranged in rings around the stalk. Um, and yeah, they do the same sort of thing. They will snap. Uh, apparently, they specialize in hunting Daphnia. Okay. It's not an insect. <laughs> Little crustacean y things. Exactly. Daphnia are adorable. But yeah, so Aldrovanda. So those are the ones you've heard of. And then the ones you haven't heard of. So the bladder trap is basically one species. <laughs> <laughs> so these are highly modified leaves um, in the shape of a bladder, as you would expect in the name, with a hinged door. Uh, and so it's lined with trigger hairs. So if one of the trigger hairs is triggered, it will suck the prey into the bladder and close the door behind it. Oh, how does it suck the prey in? It creates an internal vacuum. I don't know the details of this. Like a fish? Oh, yes! Like yes! a fish's mouth? Yes! Oh. So this is in uh, Utricularia, and this the bladder wart. So there's basically only one friend who does it, and it's super specialized, and it's really, really cool. Wow. Um, and then the last type is the lobster pot trap or eel trap. And this is a little bit different from all the other ones that I've talked about. It's most similar to a pitfall trap in many ways. So again, I'm pretty sure this is only in one genus. The plant has, again, modified leaves that basically form these corkscrew tubes that are lined with hairs and glands. And so basically, like the like the bees that can only go one direction through the flower, they can't back up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's same sort of thing. The Whoever gets trapped in here can only go forward uh, to their death. Yeah, I, <laughs> I realized what this plant must have been doing the, the second time you said lobster trap plant. Because that's how lobster traps is they have wire pointing into the trap. Yep. So once you go in now, you can slide in, you can't slide out. Right. Exactly. Once again, like a fish's mouth. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yep. That yep. one is arguably more terrifying because like the others all make so much, they're all very predatory in that it's like, I'm going to bite you or I'm going to like stick you and grab you or I'm going to inhale you. <laughs> but this one's like, you can enter into the entrance and you're already trapped. You, you and can... every bit of progress you make is just further down into my gut. Like, yeah. oh, that's like some Greek tragedy, <laughs> like punishment in Hades yeah. sort of ending for an insect. You can oh. check out any time you like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's uh, the genus uh, Genvisea. So there's basically only one friend who does that. Yeah, the friend, cool. friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there was that much diversity. Me neither. In modern day carnivorous plants. I would have, if someone had said, how much more diversity do you think there is than you're aware of <laughs> in carnivorous plants? Yes, I would have said, oh, probably tons. <laughs> well, the thing that's kind of blowing my mind is, you know, first there are versions of carnivory and plants that I wasn't, wasn't even aware of. Like, I, I assume there was more variety among the groups I had heard of, but there's whole different techniques. But also, like... The fact that the snap traps, th there are multiple ones that have evolved mouths <laughs> separately from one another. Like, yeah. that's insane. That's so cool. I had to look up a picture of the, the water wheel plant while we were going because I, I needed to see what it looked like. And that's, yeah, it looks like Scylla for, of, of Scylla and Charybdis. It's just like a multi-headed <laughs> yeah. Venus fly trap. And that's yeah. so cool. Very cool stuff. Well, so now that we have laid out what carnivorous plants are, how we how we know them today, let us, as is our custom, go all the way back. And I want to ask you, what do we know about how carnivorous plants, how does this happen? What yes. do we know yes. about? <laughs> Who's to blame? <laughs> Who do we need to write to about this? <laughs> oh my God. What do we know about the origins of carnivorous plants? What are the earliest... That, that we know of carnivorous plants. Sorry, I have to contain myself because <laughs> that actually made me start laughing so hard and crying. We're very funny. <laughs> yes. Okay, so that's a good question, though. Like, how did this happen? <laughs> and th the problem is, we don't really know. 
If someone that, was not paying attention. That part someone, doesn't surprise me. Someone <laughs> was not monitoring the right things. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Something, 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 whether or not they should. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, all right. So we don't really know that much about the origins, but we have some clues. So, like I said, that group, Karyophyllales, that group... If you look at a phylogenetic tree of the relationships of the different families in that order, there are non-carnivorous families nested among carnivorous families. Oh. Right. Which suggests that the progenitor, as it were, of that group was probably carnivorous. Because it's the outgroup is not carnivorous, but is often considered proto-carnivorous so it has some of the traits that could easily be used in carnivory such as like being sticky but doesn't also eat things at least the the um, extant versions yeah it, it has the right it has a lot of the right tools but it's yeah. not yet feeding yes. on organisms right. exactly and you're suggesting that also not only did plants evolve carnivory multiple times but they also lost it Yes. In some cases. That, which, that within the carnivorous plant group, you had some that went, eh, 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 that's fine. Which, like, I'm going back to, well, I guess it's not even vegetarianism. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Sun worship. I'm going to get, I'm going to yes. go back to working for myself. Uh, I, 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 and that, that makes complete sense because, like, mm. their groups lose traits all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And but this is a very specialized trait. What an, a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you be more like the rest of the like, family? Like, if I, I came across a secondarily autotrophic, like, purely <laughs> autotrophic predator, predatory plant, like, that's the lamest thing ever. Like finding a, a grass-eating crocodile. Yeah. What have been doing? Oh, it's Simosuchus. Okay, well, calm down. <laughs> so, so, all right. So, looking at the, so we have to rely on molecular clock data to try to get a sense of when things happen. Right, genetic data. The cool stuff. So, if you're looking just at carnivory, which I said arose, like, nine times. So, carnivory originated... Okay, things I love about molecular clock studies. Get a load of this error bar that I'm going to give you. So, (laughs) originated sometime between 8 million years ago and 72 million years ago. Okay. All right. So, that's practically all within the Cenozoic era. (laughs) Exactly. Well, and the thing about it is, it's important to note, and I should have said this at the beginning, but I got way too excited. These are angiosperms. So these are. I was just going to ask that. Yes. So these are angiosperms, number 57. Thank you. (laughs) So these are all angiosperms. These are all flowering plants. And that's very important. And I I want to talk about that a little bit later. But we only see carnivory in flowering plants. So the origin of flowering plants is somewhere in probably in the Mesozoic, they're really big in the Cretaceous. And so having the advent of carnivory being sometime, you know, between what the Miocene and the late Cretaceous, that seems reasonable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But looking within Karyophyllales, that one order that I won't stop talking about, uh, the molecular clock analyses for that, looking at just the origin of snap traps... Suggests that that or, uh, originated at least 65 million years ago. Okay. Oh. Uh-huh. Which means that there there seems to be evidence that it would not be unreasonable to think that there were at least early carnivorous plants in the Cretaceous. Which also brings to mind, for me, since before you said that you could have things like pitcher plants capturing small mammals, mm-hmm. the image of a very small little baby bird-like dinosaur yeah. falling into a big pitcher plant and then being dissolved and eaten. Yes. Put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. <laughs> I oh boy. <laughs> love having you on this podcast. <laughs> so, so you asked, how does this happen? Right. And... People have looked into that. So there have been these cost-benefit models trying to figure out what sort of circumstances do you need for carnivory to arise. And I sort of talked about it before that you need nutrients to be the limiting factor. So 
If you have an environment that is relatively open with infertile, moist soil, this is where you tend to tend to really see carnivorous plants. So for example, if you think of, say, a bog, a bog is a great place to be your carnivorous plant. And they have an advantage over non-carnivorous plants because... The nitrogen, the lack of nitrogen, is limiting plant growth. And if you can get nitrogen from another source, that allows you to accelerate your photosynthesis because nitrogen is necessary for chlorophyll. And you can use that to continue to grow and make leaves. But importantly, you can prioritize leaves over roots. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that was a great reaction. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what I wanted when I said things like that. Yeah, because the purpose of roots are to get water and nutrients. If you are getting your nutrients from an external source and you're in a moist soil, so you're not limited by the presence of, of water, basically you just need enough roots to not like fall over. Yeah, to not just be blown away. Yeah, exactly. So, so these are the types of environments that you're really going to have this uh advantage to being carnivorous unfortunately these are like the worst places to fossilize i do feel like it's particularly fitting though that carnivorous plants are basically plants at the brink of starvation (laughs) (laughs) that they're missing a nutrients they're not they're starving and they i'm so hungry i'll I'll eat that thing well they're like the deer that eat birds yeah it's like i need this i've turned to terrible yep. actions. Also, I like that they're all that they're bog monsters. Yes, they're bog monsters. That's where you yep. get a carnivorous this is... plant. Exactly, exactly. So, unfortunately, for for these reasons, uh, they don't tend to preserve very well. There is some evidence, to some degree, that may or may not go back to the Cretaceous, um, but the the solid. This is definitely a carnivorous plant is from the middle eocene okay so we're talking 40 million years ago or so 40 50 that's within our error bar so that's (laughs) we did it (laughs) good job guys that sounded pretty good (laughs) so that's the oldest official known fossil of a carnivorous plant and we'll get into why that versus some of the other stuff but it seems to be pretty agreed that the earliest evidence like undisputed I would say undisputed, but it is science. Undisputed evidence is from the Middle Eocene. Completely agreed upon by everyone. (laughs) No one disagrees. This is a fact. (laughs) Everyone looked at it immediately and went, well, yeah. I mean, if you see it, though, you'll understand. (laughs) There was was one guy who disagreed, but he's still in the bog. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Well, that brings up the the next question that I'd like to ask you, which is the question of what does the fossil record of plants, of carnivorous plants, look like, which I will wait to ask you until after the break. So join us then. Now, Allie, I can only imagine, uh, given, well, everything about them, that carnivorous plants don't fossilize well. If I were to guess, and so far this episode has been me learning that I'm wrong about things. Yep. But if I had to guess, I would guess we do not have a particularly good fossil record of these plants. On this on this point, you are correct, sir. We do not have a very good uh, <laughs> fossil record. So basically... <sighs> Carnivorous plants are a worst case scenario for preservation (laughs) because they're herbaceous. They don't have woody parts, which in Mm, exactly. So in terms of plant preservation, like if you have a choice between wood and a leaf, like the wood is going to be preserved much more often. And this, so they're all, Yeah. Like, there's a reason we build stuff out of one of those <laughs> and not as often at the other. <laughs> exactly. So they are herbaceous and they tend to be found in environments with low preservation potential. So like I said, they're found in these like bog sort of places very often. 
So when you have something that is easy to break down and an environment where you're less likely to, you know, find in the fossil record, like, eh, meh. The other thing, too, is that the only way that you can say unequivocally that a plant is carnivorous is if you have the leaves. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because, as I mentioned when I was going through the types, every single one is a modified leaf, which is a problem because a lot... <laughs> I think this is hilarious because as a paleobotanist, and a botanist too, leaves are the worst way to identify a plant in general. <laughs> like, you know, as, as you can see from what I'm talking about, leaves are super plastic. They can change shape. You know, that's that's why they're great for climate analysis, but that's why it can be hard to identify a species based on leaves alone. But when you're talking about a plant that is, its whole life is based on these leaves, if you don't have leaf material in the fossil record, you can say that it has an affinity to the group, and the group may today only be carnivorous, but you cannot actually say that that plant was. Right. So that complicates so, things. <laughs> so yeah, you might be able to get information about the, the lineage, mm -hmm. but not for sure what it was doing. Exactly. Right. Well, this is a lot like, the, the, you'll get this with animals all the mm -hmm. time, where it's like, yeah, no, this, this the living version of these are venomous, yep. Yep. but we have a vertebra, so we don't actually know if this extinct species was venomous. You, exactly. You you can't tell from a seed if a plant was, was I was going to say venomous. These are not venomous. They're just carnivores. <laughs> <laughs> that's the next episode. That was, that, that was good. That's the next curveball. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, spoilers, there's, I have no venomous plants i'm sorry viper fly what? traps oh man that that's what right that's what i want next okay sorry anyway okay so <laughs> i actually had to <laughs> i had to break it to a couple of my colleagues uh when i was researching this to let them know that hey you know that thing you say is a carnivorous plant yeah it's not so 2015 was a big year for papers about carnivorous plants. Like, I think Ooh. half of the references that I used are from 2015. <laughs> and that's not actually saying that much. Like, I don't have a lot of references because, like, there's not a lot of these things. But... <laughs> so both of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the... Generally, for a long time, it we thought that the earliest example of a definitively carnivorous plant was from the early Cretaceous. So it's about 112 million years old, and it was a pitcher plant uh, that seemed to have an affinity for Saracenia, which is the type of pitcher plants that we have here in North America. And it was found in Northeastern China. Uh, and this identification was based on the leaves. It looked like the leaves were actually forming these pitchers. Unfortunately, <laughs> a paper came out in 2015 that showed that, yeah, these probably aren't actually pitchers. And what they were actually seeing were galls in the leaves. Oh. Yeah, so... The, that the, makes so much sense. <laughs> exactly. So these were actually galls in the leaves of a gymnosperm that had been previously described. So I want you guys to make note that these are carnivorous plants that actually ended up to be related to insects. So like make a note of that. We got one. All right. <laughs> note. <laughs> so the second oldest representative of the uh, carnivorous plants lineage was Paleo Aldrovanda. So the water wheel plant, this was a, a fossil version of this. And it, this was again from the late Cretaceous and this was from the Czech Republic. So the identification of this plant was done based on seeds, which, like I just mentioned, means that it's related, you know, it's probably related to this thing, but not necessarily carnivorous. However, a paper came out that showed that actually these are not seeds at all. They're insect eggs. Hey. Wow. So two points <laughs> to arthropods. 
<laughs> two for two on tricky insects. Yes. But, however, there's actually a lot of um, evidence for the genus Eldrivanda from the Eocene to the Pleistocene. But again, these are seeds and pollen. Uh, and that stuff is probably pretty solid. But not as cool as being from the late Cretaceous when you're trying to, when you're trying to be the earliest, like, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So the earliest actually unargued evidence of the clade that includes um, carnivorous plants, there is pollen from the Paleocene because there's always pollen. And again, like I said before, probably related to, to um, in again, Caryophyllales. So, the pollen seem to have an affinity to Drosera, which is the sundew, um, possibly Nepenthes, which are the big pitcher plants. But, you know, what can you really say about the lifestyle of a plant from its pollen? Another example is from, again, seeds. These are probably actually seeds. Unfortunately, the seeds were destroyed in analysis, so can't confirm. That was a, That was alarming to learn. It's from the Middle Eocene of Australia, and again, it's related to, um, it's similar to Drosera, similar to the sundew. There's really a Drosera sundew theme going on here. They get a lot of uh, representations. Again, this identification was based on seeds, but the piece de la resistance, the one that you were waiting for, the first really, this is definitely carnivorous plant, is from the, uh, the mid to late Eocene. And again, it's some sort of sundew. It's, <laughs> it, it seems to have a, an affinity for uh, Aurora dulaceae, Aurora dula, which I'll talk about a, a little bit later. Uh, this was found in Baltic amber. And this is why we're pretty confident that this one is actually a carnivorous plant. It's because you have the leaves, the modified leaves with the stalked glands. Like it looks just like. A sundew. It is very clear by looking at it, like, I know exactly who you are. That we, like, That's easy. But the thing about it is, like, you really aren't going to get that sort of preservation of carnivorous plants very often, because in order for them to be preserved in amber, you need the type of plants that are going to be producing the sort of resin that will turn into mm-hmm. amber. And most of these carnivorous plants aren't living in those sorts of environments. So we got real lucky <laughs> with, with this one, but, and that's, that's basically it. Like there's, these are the, when I was trying to find like fossil record carnivorous plants, oh my goodness, <laughs> it was really, really hard. And every time I thought I found something, it turned out to be an arthropod. <laughs> <laughs> so yes yeah, so it this is this is the 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 trouble that i guess you have with these very specialized plants that live in these very marginal sorts of habitat habitats you know we're like we're, we're lucky we have them <laughs> like you know we don't really know how we got here but like we got them now we should be we should be happy about that <laughs> what well- I I also had a, a a thought, and I don't know. I'm sure there's dial conversation has been had about this, but with how weird and diverse and the multiple origins of carnivorous plants today, I, I it brings the thought to my head of could we find a fossil plant that was carnivorous but was not one of the ones we have today, and therefore we don't recognize it as carnivorous because it was doing some other horror show thing to ancient insects right exactly like we we already have five different types but who knows what we're missing like angiosperms have been around and have been common for 66 million years you know before that too but Mm -hmm. like you know this whole cenozoic has been team angiosperm all the way and so who knows especially considering that there are so many you know when you go back especially before the miocene there are these non-analog ecosystems in the fossil record Mm -hmm. like we Mm -hmm. have no equivalent of today so who knows like there could be an audrey (laughs) 2 out there but that does seem 
That does seem kind of unlikely, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. I do, this does right. seem so, so kind of unlikely. So the <laughs> issue here is the types of places that these organisms live tend to have low preservation potential. But let's, you know, if you ignore that for a moment, the problem, I say problem, is so carnivory, our understanding of carnivory is based on leaves. So if we, if we maintain that carnivory is has always been based on leaves, which that's an assumption that we, they can't actually say that. Mm -hmm. If we assume that carnivory has always been based on leaves, then the problem is, like, the way that fossil leaves are preserved is typically in two dimensions. Yeah, and flattened. That's not how these things live. And, you know, I... I could say from personal experience that I have found 3D preserved leaves. So in my dissertation research, I found an N of one. <laughs> I found one leaf that has an affinity for modern leaves that are uh, aquatic and are inflated. Ooh. So the way that it was, the way that it was preserved when it it actually broke. And that's the only way that I could tell because when it broke, I could see the three dimensional structure of the leaf because the preservation of that site was strange. It didn't put, make these flat layers. They were kind of like amorphous, which is the only way that I was able to actually see this three dimensional structure because it wasn't pressed together. But yeah, so who knows, depending on the type of preservation, you could potentially possibly come across this. But the other thing is, I can't remember if I actually mentioned it, but the the interesting thing about carnivorous plants is all of them are using their leaves. They're modifying their leaves to trap their victims. But mm -hmm. no carnivorous plant attacks pollinators. They're not using right. their flowers because that would be bad for the plant. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's bad for business. Exactly. But is this... Is this something they tried? Like, right. um, <laughs> imagine if, if like, snapdragon flowers were actually, like, snap traps. That would be amazing. Not that I, but, like, like, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Plants are so diverse that there's, you can imagine so many possibilities that after a point, it starts to become strange that there are only five. Right? approaches that we know of today well and that was what first gave me the idea of like could there be other bizarre strategies out there because the the five strategies we have today aren't similar to one another like i'm gonna bite you i'm going to catch you in a pitfall i'm going to glue you down i'm gonna inhale you i'm going to uh, trap you in a nightmare labyrinth yep. like it's it's they're all very different. So uh, you'd assume it had very different evolutionary history. Like how you arrive at it probably is not similar at all. Yeah. So yeah, why why couldn't we have, why couldn't there have been other ways for you to trap small animals? Exactly. I, the, the, I went down such a rabbit hole because... <laughs> You know, it was interesting, obviously, when I was looking at the fossil record of these groups because I was just so frustrated <laughs> that there wasn't more <laughs> evidence for you know their fossil record. But the path that I was most fascinated by was the one where there were no answers. Because the other thing that I'm really hung up on is why didn't other groups do this? That yeah. was going to be my next question is why just angiosperms? Why is it only angiosperms? I have no idea. So I spent about an hour today just like, why aren't gymnosperms carnivorous? And I have like, I have some ideas, but I was like, someone, someone, someone has to have asked this question before, right? Like <laughs> somebody. And I couldn't find anything. And so the nearest I can tell so my working hypothesis is why it is angiosperms versus well, gymnosperms. We'll, we'll, we'll start with the two like main woody plants, vascular woody plants, is the fundamental difference between angiosperms and gymnosperms is their growth rate. So mm. 
angiosperms are very live fast, die young comparatively. I mean, they're 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 still com- you know compared to us, they're ancient. But yes. you know, compared to gymnosperms, like they're spring chickens. And I wonder if that difference could be playing a role. So when angiosperms spread, the gymnosperms got pushed to the edges because those were places that angiosperms couldn't handle. So the reason, like the boreal forests and high elevation is gymnosperms because like they're tough. And so that could be why they have never evolved, say, carnivory, because they're tough and don't need it. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you if you think about some of the truly terrible soils that gymnosperms are able to, um, you know, survive in, and you know, nitrogen is still going to be a limiting factor because that is essential for growth. But they grow so slowly. It could just be that their require their nutrients requirements aren't as high as say angiosperms. And the same thing with if you look at like ferns or mosses and hornworts and bryophytes. I would love a carnivorous moss that <laughs> would make me really happy. But their 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 life cycle is much shorter than say an angiosperm or a gymnosperm so you know especially some of the the really small things like they you know they may live they they may live a year well if you're only going to live a year like you know you don't need to really invest in this sort of like dramatic lifestyle shift so that right right that is my hypothesis because I couldn't find any literature on this <laughs> that, which really upset me because like I <laughs> got really into this. These are very interesting. It's it's an interesting group that is made that much more interesting and frustrating by how little we actually know about it. Now, when I was putting together uh, the original plans uh, for the outline, the layout of this episode, I anticipated. That A, Allie knows more about this than I do, and B, that Allie, certainly after doing all the background research, would have discovered more things. So my last major question for our discussion today is, what else did you find? I got you. Anything else cool? Anything else cool to note about carnivorous plants? Honey, I... Have we, have we already learned all the cool things? Is this the end of the episode? <laughs> I, I have another two and a half pages of things I can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things I really wanted to talk about, because, uh, uh, Will, you keep bringing this up, and I keep saying, hold on, we'll get to it. I'm I'll, eager. <laughs> I want to talk about the relationships of the different types of traps in Karyophyllales. So in that order that I keep talking about, it's ridiculous because so Drosera, Drosera AC has Drosera, which is the sundew and the Venus flytrap in the same family. Weird. Right? So you have a sticky trap in the same family as a snap trap. So in Karyophyllales, you have... I think all but one type. So you have the sticky, you know, sticky tentacle plants closely related to snap traps. You have the sticky tentacle traps closely related to pitfall trap plants. Then you also have, that's the same family that has the, it's described as, I really love the International uh, Carnivorous (laughs) Plant Society. Like, I don't think I can say this enough. A genus of part-time carnivorous lianas and a genus of non-carnivorous lianas all having potentially carnivorous common ancestor. So that is so impressive that within this single group, you have these different types of carnivory, some in, you know, closely related families, but some within the same families. So I want to get into that. Pitfall traps have evolved six times, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a popular That's, strategy. Yeah, I mean, it, it it definitely is the one that seems like the the easiest to the, you, you form your leaf into a bowl, yes. put some juice down there. Yeah, don't yes. let things out. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> exactly. Sticky traps have evolved five times. Okay. Also seems uh, fairly straightforward. I already have sticky stuff. Yeah. That I'm using for other purposes. Yeah. That's, 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 you know, slather it on ourselves. But <laughs> snap traps, bladder traps, and eel pot traps each evolved once. 
Interesting. Oh. I didn't. I that, now, by the end of this episode, I am now surprised that snap traps have only evolved the one time. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and that's so. So the Venus flytrap and the uh, the water wheel plant are very closely related. Okay. And I want to. Again, I couldn't quite find. It's one of those things. I am not a geneticist. I really don't have a background in DNA. I appreciate all that it does for me. But when you start throwing the letters <laughs> at me, I get a little overwhelmed. So the reason why some groups um, have ori- originated more often than others, part of it is just, uh, you know, genetically it's easy to do this so you know they're Mm. already making sticky stuff in their places like oh cool we'll just you know add it (laughs) add it to our leaves but you know if you think about the complexity and you guys were already on this like i am so excited that you guys totally saw the the tracks that i was laying here pitfall traps are so easy from a plant development standpoint this is so easy you just got to make a tube Like, that's not hard. That's, you know, and it arose six times. Sticky traps. You're already using sticky things in other parts of the plant. Cool. We'll just make them digest stuff. That arise five times. But snap traps, which are so specialized. You know, they have a a hinge. And they have a trigger hair. You know, they have these trigger hairs. And actually, looking at it, I'm fairly certain that everything that has trigger hairs, because that's the snap traps, the bladder traps and the eel pot traps, all of those each evolved once. Oh, interesting. All right. It's this added level, uh, you know, layer of complexity that, you know, so far we have only gone the, down that path once for each. Yeah. Only one group of plants has evolved a trip wire. Yep. <laughs> that they then use uh, yep. for catching things. Exactly. Exactly. And so like, that was the thing that I found so impressive like not only that you have these different types of plants that are making these changes in different ways but then i was surprised that some of them only did it once (laughs) interesting yeah it's because it it means that it's not just because in the beginning when we were geeking out about how diverse they were it had this feeling very much of oh they're they're really diverse they've done this a bunch of times this is actually way more common than you Mm -hmm. think and now it's kind of going well that's not all the case yes and no (laughs) some of them are the way you expected them to be where it was it's just this very specific lineage that did this thing yeah and that's why it makes sense that you didn't know the the last two types of of traps because they only each evolved once and they're not particularly common right and they're not they're not quite as photogenic and famous and turn them into pokemon a bowl as I, things like snap traps yeah. i think that the bladder trap is underrated like the bladder war having not seen it i'll take your word for it but we'll put a picture in the blog post <laughs> but, but just the concept Like, I will inhale you. Because, you know, Will is very into this one. Oh, yeah. He keeps mentioning it. (laughs) Well, it's it's the Dyson of carnivorous plants. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I'm going to look it up after this episode because I don't 100% believe that it exists. Like, I trust you as as a friend and fellow scientist. But I don't actually believe it yet. <laughs> I'm going to have to look it up uh, and c- convince myself. I mean, I, I, I don't blame you because I had basically the same thing. Like, that can't be real. The part that I'm so hung up on, I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean it sucks it in? Like, what, what do right. you mean by that? <laughs> so one of the last, you know, one of the last things that I really want to talk about is, so we talk about this, like, predator prey interaction you know these carnivorous plants that are eating the arthropods but one of the things that i really want to talk about are the mutualisms that you have with the animals and the plants nice let's do it yes so i already mentioned they don't kill pollinators so as long as you go for the flower you're good they leave you alone i talked about roradula that was the uh the one that was in amber the like yes definitely and i'm gonna take back the yes definitely i read so many arguments about whether or not roradula actually counts as a carnivorous plant (laughs) because some people say 
that they are carnivorous plants. And some people say, no, they're proto-carnivorous plants. They're definitely somewhere in there. And the sticking point, as it were, because they're sundews, and that's funny mm-hmm. to me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sticking point is that they don't actually digest the things that they catch. Okay. So they are sundews, a, a variety of sundews. So they are they are sticky. And so these insects will be will get stuck in in the mucilage. But it's Ew. <laughs> Thank you. Uh but instead of digesting them itself like, you know, a sundew would, Drosera. Like a, a self-respecting <laughs> exactly. carnivorous plant. They phone a friend. So they rely on assassin bugs to actually digest the insects. So the plant will capture the prey. The bugs will suck out the juicy insides and then they defecate on the plant. The plant then Mm. absorbs the nutrients in the poop. I've heard about this. This one I've heard about. I knew this one. I had heard I had heard stuff like this. I just didn't mm-hmm. know if I had not heard about this specifically. That's so cool. And that's why there is this argument like does that count? Technically, the plant can do it on its own. But why would you if you could get assassin bugs to do it? So in the wild, it basically never happens. It's only, you know, I caught the thing. Hey, can you like do me a solid? They'll suck up the insides, poop on the plant. The plant's like, cool, delicious, and then (laughs) takes up the nutrients that way. So the other cool thing about uh, Roradula is the actual secretions. So they are unlike the mucilage of, of, I really like that word, (laughs) of like the sundew. So if you think of Drosera, like the the stereotypical sundew, it's, you know, it's uh, a stick with stock stickiness on it. They, they look like sticky feather dusters. <laughs> yes. So those secretions are pretty aqueous. So they're they're watery. The reason they're so watery is because they have the digestive enzymes in them. So they're sticky, but they're, you know, they're not like tree sap. The secretions in Rorodula are very resinous they are they are very very sticky and that first of all means they actually can't really have the digestive enzymes in there just the way the chemistry you know works you can't have both but also the environments that they live in means that the secretions are actually more resilient to desiccation because they don't have as much water in them they don't dry out oh yeah so today they live in the, the Finbos of South Africa. So the temperate regions, the dry temperate regions of South Africa. Um, but that was, I thought that was super cool. But like, oh yeah, we can't have like watery secretions because that'll dry out when it gets hot or when it gets dry, you know. Gotta have the really sticky stuff. I love it. Very cool. I like that. I like that we we have sticky trap plants and they also have like, I'm using... You know, watery super glue and I'm using like rubber cement like they have different types of adhesives that they're using to catch stuff that's cool yeah so I didn't know anything about that like I I, I, I vaguely knew some of the poop stuff but like I didn't know specifically <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's where I was I vaguely knew some yeah. of the poop stuff. I was I was <laughs> I was pa- had a passing awareness of the pooping yeah don't worry we're gonna talk more about the pooping so Nepenthes, so the big old pitcher plants, they are very good at mutualisms. And I'll get into the poop in a second, but I want to talk about the one that I did not know anything about, and I might have been the most excited about, excited about learning about. Okay, so do you know what a domatia is? Nope. Uh-uh. Okay, that's fair. I hear there are 101 of them. Yeah. <laughs> No. Okay. So and then, there's this, then, <laughs> then there's this really mean lady, and then there's these yep. two guys who don't know what they're doing. Uh, okay. So you know how acacia trees sometimes have little houses for the ants that live in the tree. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's a domatia. So okay. a, a domatia is it because that's literally what the, the word means that it's 
a home, you know, like a domicile. This is the home. Mm-hmm. So As I this, say, it's it's an ant dorm. Exactly. So this is a house that the plant will make for, it's normally ants, um, but, you know, insects. So there is a species of Nepenthes, uh, Nepenthes bicolcarata, that makes these domatia for ants, which this is a pitcher plant that is also making ant houses. So these domatia encourage the ants to live on the plant and these ants protect the plant from weevils that otherwise attack their tendrils and this allows the plant to better uptake nutrients you know it's not busy growing (laughs) it can focus on just like i made you a house so you gotta protect me and i'm going to you know get food for us the other cool thing is that like the plants do get, or excuse me, the, the ants do get a benefit. So the ants are able to swim in the pitcher plant fluid without adverse effects. So they are able to retrieve some of the larger prey items, which they can break down and they then they will excrete on the plants so they can actually like improve nutrient uptake. So it takes a very long time for a pitcher plant to break down really big prey items. But mm-hmm. if you have a whole bunch of ants that are going to pre-chew it for you and then poop out the nutrients for you, there was a study that showed that 42 to 76% of the total nitrogen uptake from the plants came from the ants. Wow. Yeah. That's so great. Right? These are ants feeding their house. Yes. 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 Yes, Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I guess there was poop involved, but it was (laughs) ant poop. There's always poop. (laughs) Very, very tiny poop. (laughs) Speaking of more poop and Nepenthes, the one that you guys are probably familiar with, because I'm pretty sure it was in the, not Planet Earth, but whatever the most recent David Attenborough uh, documentary was. Our our Planet? Yes, that one. Our Planet. Yeah. there is a species of Nepenthes, because they always are, uh, Nepenthes loei, which attracts tree shrews. Yeah, the shrews. <laughs> who use them as toilets. Like, they basically yeah. just... Oh, yeah. They just poop in them to mark their territory. And this is the... Be- <laughs> this just blew my mind. The poop of these tree shrews accounts for 57 to 100% of all leaf <laughs> nitrogen. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's funny that, I, I, for me, the most hilarious part of that is how much a pitcher plant is shaped like a toilet. Yep. Yeah, it's perfect. Yep. It's just a toilet bowl. It even has a lid. Yep. Yeah. Well, the thing I, I, I like about it is, ever since I was a little kid, I knew that poop equals fertilizer, which helps plants grow. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I just manure... That's always been a knowledge that, yeah, poop is good for plants. But I love that pitcher plants are like, well, let's just take out the middleman of like turning yeah. it into fertilizer. Put your poop right just here. Just poo and I'll be good. I'll use it. I uh, will take it. <laughs> and that's, I. It, it's so literal and I love it. That's fantastic. Well, and what I, I love the discussion about how the inter because we'll be think it's obviously it's an interaction between plants and animal because it is a plant eating animals Mm -hmm. but the fact that there's all this diversity in the ways that you can have those interactions i know and i don't know any of the details anymore but i know that i have read and written about that there are insects that will parasitize carnivorous plants that the plant uh, and I think this was either with sundews, I think it was with sundews uh, uh, or uh, fly traps, that they'll catch an insect and then there are other bugs that are specialized to go into the trap area of the plant and grab the food and steal it. Right? Like, it's so cool. I got one more, one more poop. And, okay. it, and, it's, <laughs> and it's Nepenthes again. So Nepenthes rafflesiana. So these pitcher plants are very elongate, you know, more so than others, which provides a roost for bats. <gasps> Guano! Exactly! The small bats will roost in the pitcher plant, and then they poop in it, and everybody...
many benefits. I, we, we have been surprised many times in this episode <laughs> yep. of the podcast, but what I would not have guessed <laughs> is that before the end of the episode, you would have made pitcher plants cute. Yep. It's just a little bat home, a little bat lavatory. A little bat house. Yeah. Little... Aww. Exactly. That's fantastic. Right? So I keep talking about Nepenthes, and I actually want to talk real briefly about the actual fluid inside the pitcher, because I went down a really long rabbit hole <laughs> about Nepenthes pitcher in fauna. So the things Ooh. that actually live inside the pitchers of these plants because of course because of course they are their own little ecosystem okay so you have the tube that is filled with fluid the cool thing about it is that it actually has two distinct layers so the bottom layer is much more viscous than the top layer which is how you can have these you know these two distinct layers so the lower part is basically where the actual digesting fluid is, which makes sense. And the upper part tends to be much more dilute because what ends up happening is, you know, the reason things die in there is because they can't get out. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the digestion process is actually incredibly slow. But yeah, so you have things that just live in the top part, you know, like the ants that I talked about before, they'll just, you know, you'll get mosquito larvae that will live in there. Yeah, so they can actually, they, you'll have these things that live in this, this this stagnant water and they'll be able to kind of scavenge, uh, you know, the, the you know things that fall in there or maybe, you know, just the bits of detritus that are sticking around from things that fall in. My favorite thing. So yeah, some of the really big ones, you'll get like mice and rats and whatever that, you know, whatever, you get some mammals, it's fine. <laughs> My favorite thing that you'll find, there is a species of crab. I told you I was going to come back to this. There's a species of crab that is well known in Malaysia for scavenging things out of pitcher plants. So it will take its claws and pull things out of pitcher plants. Sometimes they fail and they fall in. There has, <laughs> there, have been, there is evidence of them actually, you know, being digested by the pitcher plants because they can't get out. But they will, you know, they got their big old long claws and they will use it to pull things out. But yeah, I mentioned it briefly. Some of these pitcher plants actually get fairly large. Um, and so they, you know, sometimes mice, that sort of stuff will fall in. But before we end, it is very important that I answer the second most Interesting question I've ever been asked. <laughs> the most uh, interesting question I've ever been asked, which is irrelevant to this podcast, but I want to tell you because it is the most interesting question I've ever been asked. And it was by a kindergartner when I was giving a tour at the mammoth site. And the child asked me, why do dinosaurs have big tails and mammoths have small ones? <laughs> best good question. It's the best question I've ever been asked, but I'm going That's to. That's a different episode. That's a yep, different yep. episode. <laughs> <laughs> but the second best question I've ever been asked was, I was asked this by my brother about five years ago. And he asked me, could Yoshi really be eaten by a carnivorous plant? And if that happened in the fossil record, would we know? Now, so for, for some background, <laughs> to, to, despite uh, the kind of people that we are and the kind of people we assume listen to the podcast, Yoshi is a fictional kind of dinosaur uh, from the Mushroom Kingdom in the Mario games. And mm -hmm. they have piranha plants that eat. Uh, that will attack you. Yes. Continue. Correct. All of these. Things. I'm just. I'm trying to look out for all the non-nerds out there. Right? I. I'm sure they. They really appreciate you. So the important thing. Things that we need to. We need to point out here. Okay. So we're going to have to make some assumptions, right? Because um, this is a work of fiction. <laughs> so of course. We. We need to make. What? Some, <laughs> I'm so sorry to break this to you, Will. So piranha plants. If we look back at the different types of categories of carnivorous plants that I talked about, it's probably most similar similar to a snap trap. So we'll go with mm -hmm. Venus flytrap as as our you know our proxy. Okay, so the two things we really need to figure out is did they live in the Cretaceous? So would they exist with the kind of dinosaurs that you know, Yoshi is most similar to, and would they get big enough to eat something 
that was large enough for a human to ride it. For a small plumber. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Because large it, enough to wear shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because because that's an important thing. Mario can ride Yoshi. So mm -hmm. it has to be at least that big. And Mario is, I think, a, according to official uh, Nintendo canon, is like five and a half feet tall. Okay. Or maybe just under five feet. Somewhere around five feet tall. There okay. is an official number. Okay. This, this, this is important information. So, first of all, in order for this to work, we need to know that we have snap traps in the Cretaceous, because that's where we're going to get dinosaurs. And as I mentioned, they... Snap traps originated at least 65 million years ago. So, check. Yes, there were Venus flytrap relatives. We can't say for sure if they were anything like Venus flytrap. But there are probably snap traps in the Cretaceous. Okay, cool. We can answer that part. The second part, though, is did they get big enough to eat a dinosaur? And when I'm talking about dinosaurs here, like I said, it needs to be somebody who is big enough that a five-foot plumber could ride this 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 dinosaur and unfortunately that was a little bit more complicated you know i i because as i mentioned we don't really have much of a fossil record but if we look at the largest carnivorous plants today that is a pitcher plant so not you know quite the same comparison but that's uh nepenthes raja which is a fantastic name so the pitcher on nepenthes raja can grow up to 41 centimeters, which is about 16 inches tall. Yeah. Which, for a pitcher plant, is honking huge. I like, mean, that's that's actually, like, a pitcher. Yeah. Like, like a drinking glass pitcher like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could hold enough lemonade in that. Yeah, and those are definitely known to be big enough to trap small mammals. Like, you know, regularly, you will find small mammals in these traps. Okay, so... That's the largest, and it's only big enough to trap, like, a rat. So, if you're saying dinosaurs sensulato, you know, anything that could be called a dinosaur, is like, yeah, sure, I'm sure somebody was small enough, and then birds would probably fit in there. <laughs> they would probably fly out first. But theoretically, you know, there were probably some that were small enough to be able to actually be consumed. Okay, so if we ignore the fact that we haven't, met our first two criteria we've we met one but not the other <laughs> would we even be able to tell and this is something that we actually talked about a little bit which i really appreciate that because of the type of preservation you would need what would it take to tell from the fossil record that a carnivorous plant ate a dinosaur obviously it would have to be preserved in the act of eating said dinosaur Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the digestion process does take a little bit of time, so you've got a decent window there. But this is still a problem, right? Because like I talked about, you know, you need three dimensions to really be able to really understand what's going on. And possibly if it does get squished, my <laughs> you might have leaves on one side and sandwich of skeleton in the middle. But that probably wouldn't be enough for a paleontologist to be like, aha, it got eaten. Like that's, you really need exceptional evidence for that because science and all that. But also in general, you just don't tend to see uh, vertebrate fossils. You don't tend to have bone preserved in the same layers as leaves. They tend to have different, mm -hmm. you know, preservation regimes. So long story short, probably not. <laughs> Even we... we... Yeah. Probably have not been finding the evidence of all the Yoshi murders. Yeah, and it, I mean... We'll just never know about them. We'll just never know. And honestly, it's probably pretty unlikely that somebody got big enough to even eat a Yoshi to begin with. But I wanted I wanted to leave you all with that because I figured that of all people, that <laughs> was, <laughs> was a tangent that you wanted to be a part of. Well, that tangent actually leads very nicely into the very last thing that we'll do for this episode, which is a patron question. As we mentioned previous episodes, we patrons of a certain level get to ask us questions, and we have a patron question specifically for Allie, and it is a patron question of a similar uh, questioning of what plants are capable of that ties very nicely into all of this discussion about <laughs> carnivorous plants and plants eating dinosaurs. 
Allie, this question for you is from our patron Zabby, who asks, Why did plants not evolve the ability to move about like animals, bacteria, and protists? I would love to imagine a predatory plant chasing down an antelope. <laughs> That really does tie so well into the, especially the Yoshi discussion. Okay. <laughs> so there are a couple of ways that you could look at this, but I think the main constraint is the fact that plants get their nutrients from the soil. So that means that they're rooted, literally and figuratively, they are rooted <laughs> in place. So, because if you think about even like the most, basic plants you know the simplest plants they do have roots they you know mosses might not have extensive roots but they do have roots and that is really the limiting factor here like that is why you don't have galloping plants that is why unfortunately ents are not a thing <laughs> <laughs> because that plants would have needed or would need to in the future develop an alternative way of getting not just nutrients, but water. Those are the two main mm -hmm. things that plants get from the soil. They get from the roots. And that's the main, you know, nutrients in, in water are like half of what you need to be a plant. So like these carnivorous plants are able to get their nutrients from an alternative source, which is right. So we're getting rid of that, that, that nutrient limitation. However, water... <laughs> Plants only get water from their roots. So unless plants were able to get water in some other way, because they're already using their, their leaves to photosynthesize, and they, plants only lose water through their leaves. They don't gain it. So mm -hmm. that's really the limiting factor. Uh, but plants like do move pretty quickly in a lot of different ways. They just don't gallivant. Because if you think about like you know the snap traps, that is rapid plant movement. Or if you're... Mm -hmm. um, familiar with like the sensitive plant if you touch the leaves they immediately swing shut right or what is the name i don't remember the name of it squirting cucumber i think is actually what it's called <laughs> but the the plants that will explosively disperse their fruit yes yes oh right right yeah yeah so that is you know rapid plant movement so there there, there are some ways that plants can move rapidly because plants move all the time. If you ever, you've, if you've ever seen those time lapses of people looking at their plants throughout the day, mm -hmm. they, they're constantly moving. They're just not walking. Right, right. Well, there was a similar, sort of the opposite question that came up in our end of the year Q&A, which was the question of why don't animals photosynthesize? Yep. And one of the things that I came across in discussions that I read online was that it might be that photosynthesizing doesn't give you enough energy to fuel a moving around body, especially to chase if chase antelope. <laughs> while you're moving, you keep changing your relation to the sun, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're, even if it's on your back and your your back's moving or you're going under shade, you're you're possibly interrupting photosynthesis. But then also that while well, animals have to eat a bunch because we ask a lot of our bodies metabolically. That's that's literally why they have to chase down the antelope because they have yep. to eat other things. <laughs> and yeah, that's exactly it. Like the, the thing about plant, the reason that plants live on an entirely different time frame than us is they're metabolically, they just live so much more slowly. Like angiosperms yeah. are, you know super speedy compared to gymno gymnosperms but like compared to an animal you know it's it's a it's a different level entirely and that's part of it like because they don't move they are able to rely on you know basically they can get by with with less because you know they're not they're not chasing down a gazelle they're not wasting energy. <laughs> They're not wasting energy. I saw a paper that came out, or it was a it was a uh, article that came out recently because it is a it is a well known fact that I desperately would love to photosynthesize. <laughs> I think that would be great. But the amount of skin you would need to have enough, you know, space to photosynthesize is ridiculous because our brains are incredibly energetically expensive 
and yeah. you know, even if you're just supplementing it like it, also you're covered in clothes so like that's the other thing too if you're photosynthesizing <laughs> and also wearing clothes you are not making um you're not, you're not, not really utilizing your opportunities to their fullest but you know that's another problem society probably yep. would frown upon <laughs> yep. photosynthesizing in public it's <laughs> nudist beaches would be a, a buffet if we could photosynthesize. <laughs> well, Zabby, thank you for that question. Uh, and as we wrap up the episode, thanks to all the people, all the many people who requested this topic. Yes. Thanks to all of our new patrons, all of our old patrons. One of our patrons, incidentally, is here uh, as a guest on the podcast. Hi. Thanks, hey, Allie. Hey, thank hey, you. I got you. <laughs> and uh, thanks, Allie, for joining us. For teaching us about carnivorous plants, we have learned a bunch. I have some YouTube videos to go look up. Yep, so many cool things. I was going to say, sorry, this is absolutely delightful because I get to, I get to see y'all. So I get to <laughs> see when you're shocked, and it's great. Yeah. <laughs> this is, as we said earlier, the first in our new tradition of plant-related episodes on episodes that end in the number five. So 10 episodes from now on episode 115, we will have Allie back. So listeners, start sending in your plant requests because we, we want to fill a whole list. As always, check out the blog post for extra f images and links for more information, which I will get from Allie uh, shortly <laughs> after we end this uh, recording. Keep an eye out for the next episode. We release episodes every fortnight. Yeah. Allie, thanks again for joining us. I had so much fun. This was so worth it. <laughs> we'll see you the next time you're on. Yeah. And we'll 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 sit and then and that's that's all of my words. Yep. I'm I, I'm gonna go ponder the the horrifying life that insects the bladder, have to leave. The bladder thing. Yep. That's what I'm going yep. after. Yep. Uh, that's my first <laughs> YouTube search after this. I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> bladder. So I'm gonna find worm. out. The, that's it. We're gonna get it. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.